Okay, so now I'm going to go through the set of notes here on phase changes. Um, the first thing that you've got to understand is when we say the word phase change, we simply mean something that's changing in a state of matter. So something going from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas or even actually to, from a solid to a liquid, which you'll, sorry, even a solid to a gas, which you'll see here in just a moment. Um, generally speaking, when you're absorbing energy, so when, when heat is coming in, usually uh, what's going to happen is the particles are going to start vibrating faster and that's going to be fighting against these intermolecular forces or the forces attracting the particles together and so the faster you get the more likely it is that these particles are going to be spread out more and more uh, and so what they'll do is they're going to separate from one another uh, and they're going to change their phases. So if you go the other way, if you're removing energy from a substance as particles are going to slow down the intermo intermolecular forces which are attracting the particles together are going to be more influential it's going to pull them all together and they're going to solidify or, or if it's a gas they're going to condense down into a gas because they're going to be attracted to one another and pull in Okay, so this is one of the main points actually of this PowerPoint. It has to do with how energy is involved with phase change. And so what you do uh, is as you add energy or as you add heat, you go from a solid to a liquid to a gas. Uh, and this should make sense. So like if you're taking something that's solid and trying to melt it, say you're trying to melt ice or you're trying to melt butter, you have to add some energy to it. So whether you're putting it in your microwave or putting it in, on your stove or something like that to melt something, we need to put energy in. Also to boil something, to go from a liquid to a gas, we have to put energy in. So if it's going in that direction, solid, liquid, gas, we're adding heat. If we're adding heat to the system, that means heat is going in, which means it's endothermic. Okay, which means two things. One, the kinetic energy is going to increase because the temperature is going up, and so things are going to be moving more. And the other thing is it's going to change phase, so the potential energy is going to increase because more space is going to occur between these particles that want to be close together. And so as you pull two things apart that want to be close together, you're adding potential energy. Now if we go the other way, gas to a liquid to a solid, we're losing energy in this case because a gas, you know, a gas has more energy than a liquid does. So if you're losing energy, all right, then it's going to be exothermic. So gas has more energy than liquid does. If we go from a gas to a liquid, our system has lost energy that energy has to go somewhere, so it goes into our environment, so it's exothermic. And in this case, both the kinetic energy and the potential energy are going to decrease uh, because the particles are going to slow down, so the kinetic energy decreases. The particles are going to move closer together, so the potential energy decreases. This is a list of all of the different uh, phase changes that you have to know. So. Uh, here it asks about, uh, so here it describes a bunch of different things that look probably familiar to you. Um, melting and freezing you should be familiar with, although you should know that generally speaking that process is called fusion. Um, and then vaporization and condensation. Vaporization maybe you're not as familiar with. Um, that's just a fancy word for boiling, uh, but you need to know that it goes, uh, vaporization is when something goes from a liquid to a gas. Uh, and then there are these other two weird ones that we don't come across very often sublimation and deposition. So sublimation is when we go from a solid to a gas. Deposition is when we go the other way. Um, and some examples of this happening in the real world. Uh, the most common example that's given for sublimation is dry ice. With dry ice, when you add heat to it, it becomes carbon dioxide gas directly. So dry ice is frozen carbon dioxide. Without entering the liquid phase, it becomes carbon dioxide gas. And that's why we call it dry ice, because it doesn't get wet. It doesn't have a liquid form. So it sublimes. It just goes directly from a solid to a gas. Deposition is a little bit more rare, because usually you need some really high pressure situations or very low pressure situations for deposition to occur. Uh, what's happening there is a gas is going directly to a solid. And um, in that case, um, you know, the most common example of that would be something like frost appears on a window, uh, what's happening there is, um, you know, water from the air is condensing uh, and then freezing right away. And so uh, that's pretty close to deposition. It doesn't really have, actually, it doesn't really have a liquid form there, at least not for very long. 
Um, you know, as I said, you might consider that kind of freezing, uh, sorry, kind of condensing and then freezing, um, but uh, it happens so fast, one might call that deposition. A couple other things to remember here is if you're adding heat, uh, then it's going to be endothermic. So if we're going in this direction of solid to a liquid to a gas, that's adding heat. If you are going in the other direction, gas, liquid, solid, uh, we're removing heat. It's giving off heat. It's exothermic. Um, if you go directly from a gas to a solid, that would be exothermic as well. Here's one other big point. Uh, I ask you the difference between evaporation and vaporization. So both of those are going from a liquid to a gas, right? But evaporation is not the same thing as boiling. It's not the same thing as vaporization. Evaporation is unique in that it happens at room temperature. And what it is is it's little pieces of the liquid that are escaping into gas phase just because of the random collisions of particles. Just a few of them have enough energy that they can escape into, into gas phase. And so little by little, we'll have, like, let's say you have a cup of water. We'll have individual molecules of water leaving it one at a time up into, up into the air, not at the boiling point, just at room temperature. And so that's the biggest difference there is vaporization or boiling has to happen for water, let's say, at 100 degrees Celsius at the boiling point, whereas evaporation can happen at any temperature. Um, this is how do you distinguish between the melting point and the freezing point. This is kind of a trick question. You don't really, because the freezing point and the melting point are exactly the same thing. So water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. It also melts at zero degrees Celsius. Um, just freezing is going one way, melting is going the other way. All right, uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about this interesting scenario with boiling and how it has to do with atmospheric pressure. So technically speaking, uh, boiling only occurs when um, the vapor pressure, which I'll, I'll describe what that means in a second, is more than the atmospheric pressure. And I guess I'll go on to this next slide and just show you. The vapor pressure here is the pressure that's created by those particles that are escaping the surface of the liquid. So I said, um, remember, at any temperature, you've got some particles that are leaving the surface of the liquid. And those are kind of in competition with the particles that are already in the atmosphere, which are coming slamming down on that, on that liquid. And so what happens is when the pressure of all those particles that are being sent off by the liquid equals the pressure of the atmosphere, something will tend to boil. And so this means that the boiling point that we give, so for instance, 100 degrees Celsius for water, is actually only true if we're at sea level. Um, the, the boiling temperature of water actually changes depending on where you are. So if you're in some place like, say, Colorado, where we, we have a higher altitude um, and there's lower atmospheric pressure, it's going to be easier for that liquid to boil because it doesn't have to fight against the atmosphere as much. Um, and this means, when I say easier to boil, it means it's not going to have to be as high of a temperature. And that means it's going to take a longer time to cook. And so. Uh, if we're cooking, say, our macaroni and cheese, and it is at 90 degrees Celsius instead of 100 degrees Celsius, we'll have to cook it for longer because that water just isn't as hot when it's boiling. Now we're going to get into talking a little bit more about how energy is related to this phase change process. So we talked a lot before about intermolecular forces, which is the attraction between different particles. And um, what this has to do with here also is that like, as particles are attracted to one another, if, if they're attracted and you move them apart, you're giving it potential energy because they're going to want to go back together. So position affects the potential energy. Um, when we're changing phase, we don't change the kinetic energy. We don't change how fast the particles are moving. Um, so when, for instance, if we're heating water up to its boiling temperature, then we're changing kinetic energy if we're heating it up. If we're going from, say, 20 degrees Celsius up to 100 degrees Celsius, we're making the particles move faster. But what, once we get up to that boiling point of water, with, once we get up to 100 degrees Celsius, uh, we're not going to be changing the temperature anymore because uh, all that energy that we're putting in is going into separating those particles from one another, which is going into the potential energy which means you get a constant temperature there for a while. So I give this example, I say, 
if you were boiling water on the stove and you accidentally forgot about it for a while and then came back, um, it's not like the water would be really, really incredibly hot. The water would be the same 100 degrees Celsius that you would expect it to be um, because what's happening is all the water that's boiling, all the water that's turning into a gas is actually just completely escaping the pan. The liquid that's left is all at the boiling temperature. It's all at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, now I'm going to get into talking about numbers specifically. So we have this number called the heat of fusion, and what that is is just the energy required to melt something, to change it from to a, a solid to a liquid. However, it's also the, the opposite process of that, going from a liquid to a solid, or freezing, um, it has the same amount of energy difference, it's just in the other direction. So one process has a, a positive change in energy, one of them has a negative change in energy. And so uh, what's happening here is, you know, heat of fusion will represent both melting and freezing. Uh, and then heat of fusion is based on how attracted the particles are to each other because heat of fusion, when we're melting something, we're taking its particles and we're pulling them just a little bit apart uh, so that they can move around as a liquid. And so the stronger the attractive forces we see, the harder it is to pull them apart. So it's going to have a higher heat of fusion if there's a stronger attraction between the particles. This is the equation here that we use to calculate enthalpy when we're talking about uh, melting or freezing. So M times heat of fusion. So this is going to be a little example problem that we go through. So it says the heat of fusion for ice is 334 joules per gram. How much energy is needed to melt 7 grams of ice? This is the equation that we use. So the first thing we're going to do is pull up the mass out of the equation. It's 7 grams. Okay, 7 grams of water, and we multiply it times the heat of fusion. You can see this is just like one of those normal conversion tables that I use. So if we say it's 334 joules per 1 gram of water and multiply them by each other, cancel out the units, and we end up getting 2,338 joules. But you have to look at sig figs here. So here where it says 7.0 grams, that is 2 sig figs, 334 joules is 3 sig figs. And then this 1 gram down here, this is actually kind of a perfect 1 gram, so it has infinitely many. And the reason is because if you look up here where it says 334 joules per gram, what's happening is um, the, the approximation or the rounding is going into 334. This is per 1 gram, but the rounding happens when we say 334. So that technically has three sig figs and the 334. Um, but our answer should have two because this 7.0 had two. So we run that to two sig figs, we get 2,300 joules. Now we have to think about the direction that we went here. We were melting, which is an endothermic process, and, and if it's endothermic, it needs to be a positive sign on that. Okay, vaporization and condensation is very similar. Uh, what's happening here uh, is we're pulling the particles apart, but in this case, when you're going from a liquid to a gas, you're pulling the particles much, much further apart than you were when you were going from a solid to a liquid. And so it's going to have a higher energy requirement to go from a liquid to a gas. Uh, one of the reasons we're given here, as I said, is because the particles are going to have to be spread way more, out way more when we're going from a liquid to a gas. The other reason is because, as I said earlier, you've got that air pressure to fight against. And so it takes some energy just to get the particles to move out into the atmosphere when there's all those particles already in the atmosphere slamming around. So for heat of vaporization, we're going to use this HVAP symbol. Um, and it's the energy required to boil something or the energy that's released when something condenses. So again, this is for both processes, vaporization and condensation. One is exothermic, one is endothermic. So, uh, and just like with solids and liquids, if you've got stronger attractive forces, it's going to be harder for this to boil. So it's going to have a, a higher heat of vaporization if you've got stronger intermolecular forces because it's harder to pull them apart. This is the equation that we use for heat of vaporization. Notice it's exactly the same equation. It's the only thing that's changed is this little subscript here on the H. And so we go through, this is a similar problem, it says the heat of vaporization of ethanol 
is 839.1 joules per gram, how much heat is released when 35 grams of it condenses. So in this case, we start with our 35 grams, we multiply it here by the heat of vaporization. We see here we've got two sig figs in the 35, we've got three sig figs in the 839.1. That one gram on the bottom remembers infinitely many. So we end up with 29,368.5, but we have to round that to two sig figs, so it's just 29,000 joules. So in this case, we're talking about condensation, and so the system is losing energy in this case because it's going from being a gas to being a liquid. And so since the system is losing energy or giving off energy, it's exothermic, which means we're going to put a negative sign on our delta H. So, um, you know, if, if it asked you, this question asked you how much heat is released, um, the answer to this, actually my final, final answer would probably be 29,000 joules are released if I was putting it in a sentence form. But delta H is negative because, uh, because delta H is talking about the change in enthalpy. Um, the only distinction there is when we say released, the released has a kind of implied negative in there. So 29,000 joules released may, means the same thing as a delta H of negative 29,000.